to be healthy or to be living is to be aware of how complex we are and how diverse we are on a cellular level um you know and the reason why mainstream medicine is failing everybody like everybody the reason why mainstream medicine is one of the leading causes of mortality in the western world is because the approach and the methodology and the philosophy of it is way off way off so how do you differentiate between what you're born with yeah and what you can change yeah it's, it's incredible man as in as in what you what you're born with then it's just yours it's just it's just who you are it's, it's your soul's journey y yeah yeah you know what bro is observing my child i had this certain type of cuz i'm constantly kind of <coughs> evolving my state I'm not the same person I was before my child was born and certainly different from when my child, you know, turned six months, for example. Um, and just observing his behavior and how he's just evolving day by day, week by week. And I've tried, like, I've been so conscious of where we go and where he is and who he's around. But there's certain things I'm seeing in him i'm like i couldn't have that wasn't something that wasn't a consequence of being somewhere or developing a, a kind of an experience mm. like it's too early for that can you give an example like he's carrying certain fire in him <laughs> it's just like <clears throat> mm. like he's been in such a peaceful place he was born in a certain way we were in nature so much. So many think boundaries we created as parents before he was born, during her pregnancy, how he was born, after he was born, where we were, how, you know. It's not just been an average kind of, you know, going to work. You know, my wife, she's, she's becomes a mother. I'm at work. Everything's chaotic. Everything's been, been focused and centralized around the child coming into this realm. Do you know what I mean? It's all been about him. And super focused on making sure he's not in environments where the energies are going to disturb his natural evolution as just this pure creature, mm -hmm. you know. But then I'm like, why are you so hot-headed? Like, you are all this fire in him. And I'm like, well, this is, this is him. Mm -hmm. I can't, you know, can't take this away from him or try and calm him down. Mm -hmm. Judging for it. Yeah, no, no. This, this is this fire. If it's channeled in the right way, can protect women and children in the future. So, it's it's about if he's born with a fire, keeping that a certain nurturing that temperament to to have that fire utilized in wisdom uh, and in proactivity and in reflection, not in reaction. Do you know what I mean? Where he can be a risk to himself and others. That fire can save his life and it can protect women and children. Mm. You know, and that's got... It's not even like I've projected that upon him because he's he's so young. So he's born with that. You know, and obviously there is an, a, a genetic element to that because of the people we are, where we come from, the generational trauma that we carry. Um the bloodlines we come from so it's understandable that there's, there's, there's fire in him he's certainly not a, a passive human he's not going to be a passive human being he's always watching um but so it's i've dedicated the last seven eight years to understanding me so i can when we've been blessed with a child it's okay how can we honor his 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 kind of his personality that he has innately within him and allow him to fulfill and pursue whatever he's been destined for in this realm without stopping him or slowing him down or pushing him too hard because of our fears or anxieties or insecurities um so it's obviously super challenging but that it necessitates an extremely connected relationship with my wife to allow that because one parent isn't enough Especially the mother being, you know, him spending so much time with his mother. 
of these early stages in his formative years, he's constantly suckling on that boob. So if she's not connected with herself, her bloodstream, her emotional or spiritual body, that's being passed on to him. And if she doesn't understand who she's about and her boundaries and how safe she needs to be around other people and what environments are healthy and productive for her, then there's going to be a, you know, there are going to be limitations in how much we can achieve in keeping this child as free from parental projections. Mm -hmm. It's possible. How do you navigate things you don't agree on with you? Um, Is there much? Not really, no. I think this is really interesting because, um, and you know, we there's no such thing as perfect. And I remember hearing someone say that perfection is individuality. When you are s- extremely authentic with your individuality, that is as perfect as you're going to get. And I suppose that is the perfection we want to see in the child, is him absolutely repping his authentic personality what he's born with but then also teaching him wisdoms so such that so that our life wouldn't have been a waste and our experiences wouldn't have been a waste we can teach him things to save him time because if if you're passionate passing on information and data from generation to generation you can speed up the human experience of the next generation because you've learned lessons they don't go to waste you know you pass those lessons on the grandmother sits with the grandson, teaches him the wisdom. Feels like that's not happening these days. No, of course it isn't. Of course it isn't. Um, Feels like lots of wisdom has been lost. And we don't look to humans anymore. No. We look to other yeah, screens and corporations books. to yeah, tell yeah. us what to do. Exactly. And they're just causing us more separation. Te- terrible separation. So is this, is this uh, made you f- reflect on your early years growing up? Yeah. Like, and what things you I mean, d- deeper instilled within you or derived out of you yeah you know um this i'm i've been almost discovering parts of myself whilst through observing my son because it's very difficult to connect it was very difficult in throughout my life to connect on such a deep emotional and spiritual level with my my parents to understand more about who I was what I was like what I gravitated to as a kid because you know so many of us waste decades not really knowing who we actually are just living through this this mask and lens of who we want to be perceived as or whatever we've been indoctrinated into so you know, the more I've been actively pursuing my truth, you know, and, and healing my childhood way before, I, it didn't take my, my son to come for me to go, I need to pay attention to this shit. It was, I already was on that journey. It was just propagated real, real, like, into a different level when my son was born. More so when, when, I, when my, my wife was, was um, carrying him because we, we had, we had, multiple miscarriages before that so that was a, a dynamic within itself and I talk about these things openly because you know um, people need to understand the reality of life you know and anybody you get here who's talking you know whether they're clinicians or coaches or practitioners or just motivational speakers or PTs whatever the certainly my ability to connect with the people that I work with lies heavily in the experiences I've I've had mm-hmm. um, that's what makes it powerful there is an, an element of I know how this feels like man sister brother I, I understand I've been there it's format that's far more powerful than yeah I read that study do you know what I mean because that emotional profile is what makes us human um, but obviously there's there's a balance between Understanding the, the realms and the paradigms of the the literature and mm-hmm. yeah, you know. I'm curious to know more about your upbringing and yeah. what that was like for you. Because when yeah. I when I see you and yeah. I I see how you live your life, yeah, 
I respect it. I feel like there have been some challenging times mm. and it's made you into who you are. It's made you humble mm. and you've done a lot of introspection and, and just <coughs> di diving into the conditioning and the realms. Yeah, yeah. My childhood was very interesting and I'm, and I'm sure everyone's childhood was, but the way that I've observed my the way I've understood myself to be for many years was always through the lens of my childhood. You know, when people, whenever I've met people, especially years before, kind of in my past life, where I didn't have a clue who the fuck I was. And I, sometimes I'll, you know, the F word will just slip. So I do apologize for that. I'm working on that. Um, All we love you as well. Come here. Uh, yeah, so my um, my upbringing, yeah. <clears throat> so over the years, I was whenever I'd met somebody in in a social gathering, when I was extremely sociable and uh, out there, you know, in the entertainment world, in the underground scene, um, discovering myself, sabotaging myself. Um, I always used to. I had this fascinating story that I would always share with people about my childhood and that would be a, the introduction to who I was and I carried that for so many years you know I am I was born in North Africa I was born in Algiers um, you know in the time where there was civil war in, in, in Algeria and there was a lot of political instability um, you know I had my father's side were very strong, a strong presence in the community. Um, big family. My mother's side, it was a completely different energy that I got from my, my, my dad and his siblings, my grandparents from that side. And in a certain clemency that I, that I got from my mother's side, there was a huge bias towards the feminine side of, of my childhood. I suppose that was just intuitive from the energies that I received. Mm, all the rejections, that yeah. perhaps. Or, or the, yeah, and the rejections, yeah. Mm. Both my, but but also talking to my my aunties and you know from my dad's side, my my grandma from my dad's side, and my grandma from my mom's side. Both of them passed away when I was in very close proximity when I was um, around four or five. My grandma died of leukemia, um, and my other grandma died in a car crash where my dad was driving. So you can imagine, like, at the age of five, my dad was in a car crash. As a driver, his his brother and his mother just died in that car crash. And my mother, her mother passed away of a cancer, and they didn't tell her that her mum was dying from cancer. So you can imagine that these two major traumas happening in my first informative years. And then the civil war going on at the same time. Um, then my sister was born when I was, uh, so five years after me. And about a year after that, less than that, we emigrated and left Algeria. So my dad left everything, dropped everything. And we left. <coughs> you know, um... My dad wasn't. I'm gonna say, it was. He was an entrepreneur. He was working. He was doing business. He was. We had a house. We weren't rich, but things were moving. You know, there's some level of stability, materialistic stability, um, and then just like that, overnight. Um, and it was difficult to leave that country. Couldn't just get a visa and leave. So there had to be loopholes you had to to find. Um, to to get a gateway to salvation abroad. So we managed to leave, and I had my seventh birthday in France in in Paris. I remember that vividly. Um, so you can imagine traveling, airplanes, this, that, visas, embassies, lots of uncertainty, L lots of that. Um, and then we landed in England in 1999 in London. And again, just lots of instability in and out of hotels and fam f family friend rooms and bedsits. And, and then 
yeah, so my first seven years of life, as I understand it now in my clinical practice, is 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 definitive in the formation of your identity, your behaviour, your your kind of intellectual profile, um, and how you understand yourself and how you see the world and perceive your, the world from a subconscious neural level. So the things that trigger you, the things that make you happy, the things you want, the things you you want to stay stay away from mm -hmm. um, and all the healing or all, all the kind of transformational work that I do over the years physical therapy you know manual therapy nutritional therapy all these things um, are heavily focused on understanding people that I meet from their first initial experiences of what it is to be human uh, and that's why I, I pay so much attention and I paid so much attention to changing my, myself mm. before becoming a father because I recognized that if we did those first seven years right, then it would be much easier to um, kind of um, propel a being which we are responsible for into civilization from a place of open, free, um, you know, Neural functioning, not through fight and flight, survival mode, which, which, you know, if if you study the human people's diseases and pathology and, and mental health and behavior, you will see that whether you, whether it's criminals or, or suicidal people or, or narcissists, or psychopaths, addicts. addicts, you know, it, it depends how far. It's all a spectrum. But if you know, if you get those seven years wrong, mm. the more wrong they are, the worse your contribution to society is going to be. What do you think the common thread is with all those people? The common thread, yeah, cortisol. <laughs> yeah, if that's that's that that's the word. I mean, that's a reality in itself. Because for cortisol to to constantly be in the bloodstream. There is a um, a physiological, psychological um, pattern. So would you say cortisol was so high for those seven years that it becomes a baseline and you need to keep doing certain things quite extremely to feel normal, feel okay? It, it's not necessarily related to extreme. It's more about your nervous system doesn't understand, does not have a baseline stability at rest and digest. Mm -hmm. Its baseline stability and function is fight or flight. So, from the very formation of your human narrative, you don't know or you don't affiliate on a neurological level with peace. And that's what everyone's after, right? Yeah. Everyone wants to have peace and happiness. Connection. Yeah. Yeah, connection. Peace comes... Connection. Connection brings peace. Sure. You know. Connection brings happiness. It's, it's important. Because we, we are social creatures. We need to be connected to other human beings. And that's why the, the modern... The postmodern uh, situation is, is, is really dangerous for us as a civilization and as a species. Because it's really removing basic needs we have as um, social creatures. Right? Whether you want to look at a purely atheistic, material, physical being, or more uh, spiritual, um, kind of uh, uh, emotionally complex spiritual being. Mm. Right? Both of those necessitate the things we've just spoke about so it doesn't really matter whether you 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 believe we came from chimpanzees or, or we have a divine kind of uh, origin we are social creatures and we need to be connected to other human beings not machines and not virtually connected to people there, there is there is a biological kind of um, metaphysical energetic reality to that mm. essential 
I often find when I'm alone, thoughts arise, sensations mm. that are sometimes awkward. I start to maybe distract or they're unhealthy, what I would say unhealthy tendencies that mm. only happen when I'm alone. Mm. And I sometimes feel when I'm with people, I don't have them. Well, I I know that. I don't have them. They're, they're just completely just evaporate. Yeah. And I And I think to myself, well, is that because I need to be with people or mm. is that just the distraction? Yeah, it's good. It, somewhere in the middle of those two. <laughs> because knowing how to be alone is what's going to enhance your ability to be with others. When you're comfortable in self, you understand self, you know who you are, or being around others authentically is uh, becomes natural and seamless which will propagate you towards a deeper connection with others so it starts with the self but at the same time um, if there is work to do and, and your baseline is fight or flight then being alone and not being busy uh, creates an opening for the subconscious mind now to race um, and pursue purpose um, and that purpose is usually driven subconsciously by those formative years because that's what has been ingrained in our in in in, in our um, uh, programming the brain is, is far more advanced than any computer and the computer has a hardware has a software mm -hmm. so softwares need constant updating hardwares need to have a certain level of durability and stability and if both our hardwares and softwares were were kind of came from seeds of fight or flight mm -hmm. you know an environmental instability and security mm -hmm. then unless you work super hard in in your adult years to retract the decisions that that ultimately you as as a as a young powerless human this is not your fault and that's why we have to be super careful as parents as people who who want who want to get into relationships and have children mm -hmm. because you're not going to magically have a child unless you have intercourse with um another human being and, and biologically I don't want to open a can of worms here, but biologically, you know, from an ancestral perspective, men and women have this in incredible union and they bring forth life. So life doesn't happen if you go backwards. Before there's a child, there's a relationship or there's at least intercourse. Mm -hmm. You know, the quality of that child is going to be dependent on... Yeah, the intimacy. The intimacy mm -hmm. and the intention behind that intimacy. Mm. That's a big one. You understand? So kids don't magically appear but we live in a society where children are just magically appearing <laughs> and that's a problem yeah. because you you are setting up another human being who who does not have a great start to life because there was a, the wrong intention was was, was mm -hmm. or, or lack of intention mm -hmm. just happened mm -hmm. and then who's responsible for th their safety and their psychological profile mm -hmm. And we have that in the society. We have so many single mothers and so many broken families because you have um, uh, men and women who are actually still functioning as boys and girls on on, on, on a kind of maturity level. Hmm. Um, they drive cars, they have homes, they have jobs, but they're still children. They haven't dealt with their shit. And there's this problem propagation of trauma from generation to generation so somebody has to stop that and go okay we need to take control here this can't keep happening mm -hmm. i don't care what happened to me and how bad it was and i had no control over that and ultimately you don't i had no control over my childhood my parents and you know did the best they could did they do the best they could i don't know yeah, but they did but they did the best they could they did what they did. Yeah, they did what they did with 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 the with the awareness that they had. Sure. 
so I can't blame them for anything. Mm-hmm. What actually ended up happening in my teen years to early adulthood was I was subconsciously in that blame state. I was angry. I didn't know why I was angry, but I was. Um, so I sabotaged myself, but then I came out of that, and the only way I could reverse all the sabotage and my 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 childhood, you know, instability was to first be accountable and take responsibility for the fact that this is all, you know, has nothing to do with my parents anymore. Mm. I have to take control of this situation. What and was the significant moment that made you really feel like, okay, this is on me? Yeah. I think my mind was clouded for so many years in addiction and addic- addictive uh, tendencies. Um, you know, I come from, def- you know, diagnosed myself with ADHD, which helped a lot. But this is more recently, over the last kind of 24 months. It just helped me understand, profile myself better. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, uh, substances were were super therapeutic for me. And I suppose that was an indication of how much soothing of pain I needed how bad it was growing up and and like I said I had food I had shelter I went to school but on the surface level you've got people in society just living parents doing the best for their kids putting food on the table giving them a roof taking them to sport but on a neurological level it's just chaos emotions aren't being fulfilled needs aren't being fulfilled there's there's lack of connection with those who you trust who are put there to give you uh, an introduction a definition of life and they're never present they're never tuned into your needs you know and and there's this thing oh you know we put food on the table and we're doing our best but there's a lot of parents who actually they're not doing their best it's a cop out um, and I challenge parents now to when they have young young kids or they want to become parents um couples that want to go into you know parenting i'm like you you have to try harder it's it's not going to magically just happen Mm. you know you have no idea how much stuff you're carrying Mm. so i think to summarize that ultimately you know maybe seven years ago as i was kind of getting tired of substance abuse and the the substances that I was taking and the smoking and, and everything, all the things I was trying to remedy my pain just stopped having an effect. I was getting frustrated and I suppose that was happening simultaneously as I was starting to become more spiritually aware. Because um, I was always aware of my spiritual nature. I always practiced my faith, but I, I was never fully immersed in it. You know, um, I was living a dual identity for so many years. I was I literally had two lives. Mm. Was there any pressure around you to to show up? Yeah, there. Were, yeah, there was. Pre- I was distant from my family anyway. I left home when I was eighteen, and um, that was it. I made sure I never went back. You know, so I was trying to find a way to stay back from going home. Mm. And how was your friendship group and environment? around them because I often find that it's the people we meet yeah, along yeah. the way that really do influence us and have such a big impact like teachers and yeah. whether it's some sort of podcast that you're listening to or whatever yeah, yeah. it might be that changes the course of direction and it hit you at the right time. That was what happened and one of my mentors or one of my teachers now, it, that was the, the turning point when I started watching certain content and connecting with it. That was the trigger for me to leave this country and, and go east to you know a tropical paradise island and, and actually just start fresh but i tried to quit smoking for so many years went on patches went on nicotine gum went on the vapes before before vapes became vapes you know i cut myself away from the nightclub scene i cut myself away from being around certain types of people in the nightclub scene because i used to dj i used i used to nearly went into producer music and, and 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 I was around that environment in the underground scene. Um, I think music was huge for me as well at a certain time. 
um, you know, but again, I was getting an incredible pleasure from doing what I was doing, and 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 I certainly believe that that was an, a necessary part of my growth and um, connection with self, because I did enjoy the music and I and and the substances definitely gave me more, gave me a lot of relief, but also some insights into my nature, my kind nature, uh, my empathy, my ability to serve people, you know, even when I was under the influence of substance, I was still, there's a lot of things that I, that I do now that, that, that are exactly the same, but they were layered behind anxiety and, and, and um, trying to work too hard to please others. And love others more than I'd love myself, and cared about what others thought about me more than what I cared about myself. So um, it was always living for others, performing for others, um, and that's what the dual identities, a certain type of performance and exp expression of who I was with my family and my community, um, and then that expression with my friendship group and stuff like that. And, and there's a fine line where you don't want these two communities to know to cross each other because if someone from here crossed someone from here and they'd talk about me they'd be talking about two different people so there was an honor that needed to be preserved in my family and you know all praise to the most high there was no there was no shame and it, I never brought trouble to my family home there was never shaming or blaming I was always um, able to you know, do do the maddest stuff and being in the craziest situation, but I never ended up. No one ended up knocking on my mom and dad's door. Yeah, do you, that's you know an interesting I mean? point about the dual lives. Do you think that's quite common? That yes, pe people of uh, yeah. like a Muslim, yeah, yeah, heritage background, like yeah. that, that grow in these super, you know, yeah, because we grow up in these complex, and it that propagates the the fight or flight because I come from fight or flight. Now the dual lifestyle and dual, dual, dual personality multiple personality is enhancing the fight or flight because I'm always constantly on edge so I'm taking substance to cure the constantly on edge state and firing patterns my adrenal glands are zapped because I'm drinking ton of coffee and I'm not eating great you know I come from student the student kind of undergraduate scene and, and you know there's pressures of academia and then there's going into nightclubs and not sleeping as soon as extra pressures of the uh, being in music and then you graduate and you got to now figure out who you are and what you need to do in life and what's your purpose what's next but you haven't got too much time because you've got rent to pay and you've got clobber to afford you understand so you know pe it's easy for these for people to get caught up in a circle but i was always aware and conscious and and in tune and self-reflective even when I was like you know an addict and that's I suppose what used to trigger the anxiety a lot and panic attacks a lot was because I I'd find myself in in in, in the middle of a, of, of, a, of, of a real deep hole of substance abuse at 3 a.m. looking at myself in the mirror questioning my stuff do you know what I mean it's like for somebody who's under the influence of substance and class A, you know, you're with the fairies. Do you know what I mean? Or up in the clouds or some, some la-la land. But certain times, a lot of the time, that brought me closer with my own spirit. And I'd look at myself in the mirror and I'd be disgusted at what I was doing. Mm. And I'd wake up the next day, I'd shave my head and, 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 and I'd clean myself and I'd purify myself and I'd pray. And then I was out again a few days later and it was just constant battle of states between my higher self and my, my lower self my desires and because i was weak because i wasn't putting the right nutrients into my physical my emotional and my spiritual body so i was i was you know when 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 the pied piper played his flute and he called me i, I was it was easy for me to go and join you know what i mean but i was always individual i always kind of i had connections with so many different demographics of people do you know what I mean? In town, in, in, you know, in work, in the professional scene. I had so many different versions of myself. Um, but, 
and and they all all these versions had a lot of things in common but i'd present myself in many ways with so i had friends i had so many friends i knew so many people so many people would rely on me i was the middleman for so many people but i was never at service to myself so my energy was always wasted and i was always zapped and it got to a point where i had to go oh man like i'm sh- these drugs are not going to work hmm. Because I'd you know, cut back the music, cut back the nightclubs, cut back the narcotics. Nicotine was one of the hardest. Marijuana and nicotine were the two things that were hard. I went from, you know, boom, 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 class A's to just more trying to relax myself in Marijuana. Because it, it got to the point where I was tired of showing up till 5 a.m. and doing a set. And I just, you know, it wasn't worth the money. And I, I had to be up for work. And I was still searching. At the same time, I'm, I'm, you know, taking postgraduate education, I'm I'm leveling up my knowledge and my awareness. I'm training, you know what I mean. So I'm I'm like I'm, I'm confused. I'm active, um, and there's no like rest and digest in any of this. So what would your advice be to someone who's there now? Oh man, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's hard for you to see it and have and have um the strength to change it from within being inside that soup that's why it took some a lot of inter- intervention me just seeking help from outside and then eventually a mentor came in directly digitally do you know what i mean so you just got to speak to people who have been there you know drop me a dm if you're in that place drop me a dm mm. because the ability to self regulate is non existent and 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 that is really the so that it's, is on, why it, it's on us as elders in a way. Yeah, of course. Who have been through those times to recognise yeah, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And perhaps that's put, what I do. Put out your hand, yeah. That's what I do, and I'm and I'm real with people, and I tell them it's, it's not about being a feeder and telling you what you want to hear to, what you need to hear. And I wasn't surrounded by people that was telling me what I needed to hear. Do you know what I mean? So mm. it is. It, the archetype here is inability to self-regulate. You can have the best intention. There's so many people, they try and stop, they try and quit, they try and change, but they don't because they can't self-regulate because they come from fight or flight in those early formative years. The trauma, the instability in the home, the the, the wrong schooling from their elders. You know, So the caregivers don't do a great job at instilling an ability to self-regulate. That's why I seek substance and I seek affirmation from outside of myself from society to tell me how good I am and I'm unable to give that to myself because I don't have the ability to self-regulate so for you to step out of that it's impossible you know and it will take time you know nobody dragged me out I eventually got out and changed my environment and the healing began but it took hearing the words of a wise man to go yeah like you still have to pull the trigger you still have to take responsibility and hold yourself accountable and go, man, this is like, if I don't do something radical here, this ain't going to change. And everything has to change. You can't be half in, half out. You know, people are trying to start a business and work a full-time job and go, well, I'm going to just do this and do that. No, you can't do that. You have to just pull out and go all in. Because realistically, when you're trying to give your energy to two things at the same time, which carries absolute different kind of resonance it's impossible for your nervous system to keep up with that dual identity mm. you know what i mean there's never going to be oh i mean this i'm going to work into this slowly close this door and open none you've got to close this door first and then think about opening that door you know it has to be absolute focus so i knew that my environment was was not conducive for my healing and my transformation and it kept sucking me in and i just disappeared and that was a huge growth for me because the process of disappearing that was a turning point the process of disappearing created a lot of resistance from my family because i just decided out of nowhere to just go to the other side of the world Mm. and obviously it comes as a shock when your parent doesn't know who you are and what you're going through they think that you everything's fine and you know you're making your way through the you know, perfect. You know, educational pr- um, kind of uh, uh, work ladder, mm. professional ladder. You know, they're just seeing you from the surface. You sh- show up at home now and then, and everything's great. You just hold it together. You're fucking dying to go and smoke a cigarette. 
Do you know what I mean? So that created a lot of resistance, and it, that was the moment where I, I would say the first time I was like super selfish when I said, no, I have to do this. I'm doing this. You can't stop me. The first time I put up a strong enough boundary that allowed me to walk into an opportunity that changed my life. And it necessitates that. You know, for you, I had to close a door to open another door. Because that's how reality works, how that's, that's how the world works. It's, you have to make yourself available. You know, the student, the teacher shows up when the student's ready. But the student, it can't wait for the teacher to show up for the student to be ready. You have to make yourself available. You have to go to the mountain, yeah. go into the cave, and wait for the revelation to come. Mm, you have to create space. You create the space. You remove the distractions. And then you wait. You nurture that patience. You don't try and bust your way through. Mm, I think it's relative in terms of jobs, in terms of work, in terms of wanting something different but holding on to the thing that's keeping you safe, but not keeping you happy. Yeah, yeah. You know? Man, by that time, I'd had so many jobs, and mm -hmm. I, I, was, I did so much, and I was, you know, early 20s. Yeah. yeah. I want to talk about your work and, and your kind of the, the manual therapy stuff, mm. but it's, this is led on quite nicely because it's one foot in, one foot out for a lot of people. Mm. And that is the model, really, <laughs> that yeah. we've created yeah, a very, work. a very like you can live this life, just take, just do this one thing, and it, yeah. it, you know you've got a lot of people and that are making sure they go to the gym, do this, do that, but it, you look through the lens of, you know, holistic health. It's it's the whole, and you can't really be one foot in, one foot out with your health. It needs to be a lifestyle change. Mm. You know, can you speak a bit about your work and how you communicate that to people and, and mm. work with people? I don't work with lazy people. And Is laziness a thing, do you think? Yeah, people, people, um, a lot of people out there who just can't be bothered. They, mm. don't, they don't really know what it means to work hard enough for something they want. So, with all due respect, there's a lot of lazy people out there. And, and those people don't actually rec realize the value of life the sanctity of life, how quickly your life can change and how quickly you can go from running to not being able to walk, how quickly you can go from 1010 10 vision to not being able to see, you know, and I suppose because of my upbringing, because I was, the, the, I'm, I got to the point where I made peace with everything that happened to me and all the things that I that I'd seen and experienced in the chaos and it was incredible because I was able to taste so much of life so young um, so I, I already had a like a, a soup of life that was brewing at such a young age that gave me so much wisdom both directly and indirectly from all my my kind of perceptive senses it wasn't until later on that I started to recognize the spiritual growth that I had from all this stuff the spiritual downloads that I had until I got, I was able to define my spiritual compass, spiritual boundaries. But if we come back to the question, I don't work with with people that need convincing. Mm -hmm. I work with people that are ready for change, because I am not going to waste my energy trying to convince you that your life is worth living and your health is valuable. <laughs> that's, that's that's not what I'm in. I'm here to you know, give you a helping hand and share with you the tools that have worked for me and the people that I've worked with. And, and and these tools have also been passed down from elders. They're not mine. This isn't my... Uh, I don't own this. This doesn't belong to me. I haven't qualified in anything. I've qualified in putting the wisdom that has been passed down to me to the test and watching it work. So... That's bless. My my elders, my senseis have carried this stuff and it works. That's why I carry it. And if you're not ready to receive it and you don't carry a certain humility about you, we're not going to work together. I don't care how much money you want to you want to pay me. 
you know and i turn down turn away people there is a vetting process because i my work is so deep i haven't uh systemized it in a way where i'm able to take shitloads of clients you know i don't have online programs per se my work is super deep it takes a lot of energy it's, it's, you know my one-on-one -on -one stuff is and it takes that it takes that real connection with another person to see transformation it takes time it takes focus um and it takes human interaction it takes a certain level of investment in energy you can't just pop into someone's life here and there and send them a little pdf and them to have their you know for you to change their life it doesn't work like that there has to be some blood sweat and tears and some brotherhood and some real deep conversations which no one has ever had with with this person and that's what makes me great at what i do because i have no fear in breaking down boundaries because i'm not here to be liked i'm here to help you change i'm here to tell you the truth and you will pay me to tell you the truth but i don't want to take money if i'm not i don't have the freedom to tell you the truth i need to to be authentic so my work is really um you know i always give people a chance there's always an initial assessment initial conversation initial dialogue to see where you're at but i put all my cards on the table from the very get-go there's no hidden agenda there's no hidden nothing's hidden there's no little small print i'll tell you to your face are you in or out because that's what it takes and that's why every single person i work with we get significant change because this stuff has been proven and tested for a long time i am a product of that do you understand the way i am my life my family the reason why i'm here to share and the reason why somebody is paying is paying me for my clinical practice is because I believe that if I'm not eating my own medicine then I don't deserve to be here and telling you what to do and if we look at the medical world if you look at the the mainstream medical model if we look at a lot of alternative therapists and people who have got you know beautiful practices and clinics on paper on the websites on the testimonials I don't give a shit about that I want to look at you the practitioner, the physician, how much of your own medicine are you eating? How stable is your family? How much do your children love you? How good is your relationship with your wife? I don't care about all the clients you've changed. If you're not, if you haven't been transformed by what you're teaching, then I will not listen to you. I will not take your advice. And that's why I do what I do. Because it took a certain level of filtering through you know, bogus practitioners and physicians who had the intellectual knowledge and, and the textbook understanding and the clinical experience, but their homes were chaotic. They weren't able to keep their ark airtight. They couldn't sail their boat. But then they were projecting this level of success on the social media platform or, or whatever pat platform they were, they, they were establishing their, their practices on. That's not what motivates me because I I see through all that. Mm. Is it hard sometimes to see people's relationships in like a meeting in in a just to kind of count kind of push back on perhaps someone thinking okay this resonates. How do I understand if this person is integrity is is there? Mm. Are their actions backed up with their are what we talking? Saying. Are we talking about Just another physician? Or are we talking about a client? Like someone? We're talking about people that are that they are ill, and they've gone to see someone. Yeah, yeah. And they say, right, this is what you got to do. Whether that's on a physical level, mm. you know, whether that's on a metaphysical level, like whatever it is. How do people get to that, like understanding that? Okay, so are you living this way? Well, it, it, the reason why people end up sitting with me is because they're not living that way. Mm -hmm. And it's it's upon my judgment. And ultimately, I don't judge any... I'm not judging people. 
Yeah, no, I'm thinking like someone that can't access you. Oh, yeah, but yeah. But they can access someone. How do yeah, they yeah. go for a process of, okay, you're vetting me, but I want to vet you as yeah, well. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, I, like I just, you know, mentioned, you exactly. know. Exactly. How does someone... Well, first of all, it begins on a physical plane, the observable plane. Sure. So, you know, if I'm a patient and you're a practitioner, I've just ended up in your practice... I've either seen you on a website, on Google, maybe came from an Instagram ad, maybe I've been recommended by somebody to come and see you. Yeah. There's this is a finite roots that bring me to your practice. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, one of those things has convinced me enough to pay m you money to be here, mm -hmm. to listen to what you have to say. Um, and I have been in the receiving end of things o over my, my life. Um, and like I said, the people that transformed me were those that would transform themselves. And the people that were able to influence me would influence me and touch me and inspire me to change were those that were transformed. And you can see that just by the way they carry themselves and the way they conduct themselves. It's both a, a spoken language and an unspoken language. Now, if you're sick and you're depressed or you're clinically, you know, inflamed, your ability, your 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 sense of judgment of somebody else is already off because you, you're not fully there with your senses. Things are unstable. So it's very difficult for you to make a decision on a physician you're going to work with there and then. So you have to somewhat go, well, I've got to try it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Okay, what well you got to say? Oh, you want to work with me? You want six sessions or two months? Or I got to pay up front for this? Or, you know, okay. I'm here, I can afford this, or I'll afford that. So you, you have to put their formulas to the test. So you have to go, all right, I have no choice but to say what, you know, use what you're saying. And the easy answer is if these people, if you can't connect with the person you're going to see and ask them questions, mm and be real with them and if they can't be real with you and there's a transparency a lack of transparency there and there's a filter then for me I wouldn't want to work with that person and that's why the medical world is failing people so much because there's no there's no connection between practitioner and, and or physician and the client and you know the hearts aren't in tune and this is a reality of the hearts ultimately so there has to be a transparency, a trust. So if I can't trust you ba based on how my body feels in your presence because my body is out of tune, then you can't blame that because I'm here for you to help me fix my out of tune body. Mm. Right? My, my ability to understand what energy I'm receiving from you right now is we can't even go there yet. So I have to work on what you're saying and trust and believe that and it, it's not until you go through the process whatever they've promised you whenever they've said the case was and you have to re review that at the end of the program or at the end of the two treatments whatever they've said the promises they've made you so it's very difficult a lot of people that I work with they've been through a lot of people before they sit with me and my approach is that is unique because I have been that person who has sat with a lot of people and I've heard all the bullshit, you know. Um, and I certainly don't want to... I, I owe it to everyone that wants to sit in my presence for me to give them answers the moment that they sit with me. I don't... Their, their money is... Especially the, the time we're in now. They've, they've, you know, worked super hard for that. So if I'm not sincere, if there's no integrity in my, my dialogue on day one then if we can't make some progress on your stuff from day one and that's why you know people will reach out to me there's a, there's an email correspondence there is information that I take about them about the whole history that I study before they even come in do you understand because I want to be able to see I can profile somebody just from reading a history I can profile somebody just the way they speak about themselves um, and ultimately, if, you, if you're if you coming with the wrong attitude, we're not going to work with each other because it'll keep your money because I'm not going to be able to help you because mm -hmm. I'm not here to change you or heal you. I'm here to help you recognize 
how much you got to take responsibility for yourself. Because that is fundamentally where a lot of people are going wrong in, in this in industry. Is they're making promises which they will never be able to keep. Because it, it has nothing to do with how advanced the technology is. How advanced the tools and techniques you're using are. These data driven, you know, intravenous injections, these hyperbolic chambers, all these freaking things and these incredible things you keep coming out with. On paper, they're great. But if the client and the patient doesn't recognize that they need a radical, significant change in awareness and self control and accountability, and they're trying to they see you as the messiah as the savior you're going to fix all their shit forget about it it's not going to work mm. that was just what I was thinking yeah and I make that clear from the get go hey I'm not here to save you well the only way you can heal is by understanding it's you that's doing it yeah you know it's it's not that anyone else can heal yeah. you Zach Bush talks about this like all the time yeah man and it's like the, the biggest thing that we're not looking at cancer like whatever it might be mm. if you're putting your life your ha in someone else's hands to heal you mm -hmm. it's never it might work in the moment and it might work it for a does. period of time yeah yeah because of course someone's you know altering <laughs> you and 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 they have a influence on you but ultimately that person isn't going to be around for all yeah. the time it's, it's it has to come from you people just go around in circles they have short-term improvements in symptoms um, whether it's drugs surgery or herbs if you're if you are going to the symptom management approach you will never cure a condition you will never bring the person back into balance because we have to first define what what we understand as disease or illness or sickness health is just a spectrum there's life there's death mm. there's flow and there's stagnation so, you know, if you have a river that's constantly moving and flowing, then you have, you know, a pond which just does not have any movement. Mm, there's no arrival either. It yeah. can't be, it can't be health. No, it can't. It's the, there's, a, there's a constant transition. You have to co recognize that everything is always moving. There's never a, an end point is death, but then even death is not the end. Do you know what I mean? There isn't this. There is a transition into something else. Anyway, that's what I've. Uh, well, that's believe. also scientifically fact. Cool. Yeah. You know, it does back up a lot. Yeah. Of, a lot of spiritual yeah. beliefs. Yeah, yeah. Because nothing's ever lost. Any sincere scientist will always um, prove these ancient spiritual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be open to it. Yeah. Because they know what they know, and they're open to what they don't. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If there's no agenda behind a scientist or a physicist or a cosmologist. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're sincerely in it to discover reality and truth. They will always come and sit with 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 the spiritualist. So health is just a it's just a spectrum. Mm, yeah, let's come back to spirituality. Yeah. I want to kind of maybe finish on that point. Yeah, well, um, and disease is yeah. So we have to define what is disease and what is health. People are constantly trying to achieve health, but health is just the beginning. Health is not the end goal. You know, health is the foundation for like vibrant living. Mm. There is no health; you can't live. So everyone's trying to be healthy, but the industry, and again, the industry is capitalizing on that. Both the drug and surgery-based allopathic approach and the alternative herbal, natural approach—they're still pushing the same agenda: health, 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 health. But what is health? And, and clearly, it's not about health. It's about what health facilitates. And it's about allowing you to achieve things and to achieve and to... It's not about being alive, it's about living, you know? So we just have to... When you go to, to a clinic or a clinician, they just want to get you out of pain. I don't want to get you out of pain. I want to get you into life. I want to get you into living. I want you to start to feel again. Pain is no problem. Everyone wants to stop the pain. Pain is an incredible blessing. Pain is sensation. Sensation is awareness. Awareness is life. So everybody's walking around with pain and trying to stop it. Man, the pain is trying to communicate something with you. If you stop and 
try and download what the pain is trying to tell you, you don't, don't see the pain as a symptom or the problem. The pain is a communication of the problem. So if we can go to why there is pain and the root cause of that communication, we don't need to stop the pain. We can just go to, because the pain is the messenger. Why shoot the messenger or give the messenger the, the focus? Let's go to who sent the messenger, the source. So if we can go to the source, we can cure the problem or balance the problem without ever dealing with the pain. Everybody's scared of pain. Everybody doesn't want, want the pain. But my life's been full of pain. And when I was trying to sedate the pain, it wasn't getting anywhere. That's a beautiful way of communicating. You know, that just the whole makeup of uh, what we're what we're delving into here. It's beautiful. Yeah. There's a guy called uh, Dr. Perry Nicholson. He's got yeah. this thing called Stop Chasing Pain. Okay. Because that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. We go there. We do this. We go there. We do. Yeah. This. We like. We chase the problem. Well, what we think is the problem, but mm. it's actually just signalling something's happening. It might not even be a, a, what that is. You know, it's like on the physical level we chase that yeah yeah that sensation right there yeah let's let's do something about that well actually okay well no it's a cue here's the light on a dashboard it's communicating something mm. a, a wise man will, will will ask why is that on the dashboard instead of going oh just get that off the dashboard or cover it with tape yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and you know we we are multi-layered beings to be healthy or to be living is to be aware of how complex we are and how diverse we are on a cellular level. Um, you know, and the reason why mainstream medicine is failing everybody, like everybody, the reason why mainstream medicine is one of the leading causes of mortality in the Western world is because the approach and the methodology and the philosophy of it is way off, way off, you know in retrospect to helping the patient it's helping the institution and the corporation it's not helping you it's not helping your son it's not helping your grandma and i'm dealing with this all the time you know what i mean people messaging me because their grandma's been scheduled in for a knee replacement and i'm like okay has anybody had a look at her anatomy no it's like so we everybody knows by now that the, the mainstream model is doomed uh, it chases it chases symptoms. I have a problem with the alternative model. People think is the solution. Okay, what's right? the alternative model? The integrative medicine. Yeah, the integrative alternative. You know, me alternative medicine or integrative medicine or functional medicine or you know, naturopathy or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. so Oste osteopaths, chiropractors, uh, nutritional therapists, herbalists. Reiki healers, acupuncturists, all this. I'm talking about this stuff. Okay, I'm, I'm not hate. I'm not hating on them. I'm just saying. I'm trying to give examples of what I mean by alternative medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, um, you could call certain a lot of these people specialists. Do you know what I mean? Um, but then, I discovered that because the human being is so complex, there has to be a generalist understanding of the, of the of the human sure. organism so the biopsychosocial spiritual model makes sense to me as just a, a basic framework of how I understand a patient that I work with mm -hmm. the biology, the anatomy, the blood, the cells and lymph, the nerves the physical structures um, and then you know the psycho, the mind, the behaviors, the thoughts the ideologies, the indoctrinations, the institu institutionalized agendas, the belief systems, the traumas, the things you're watching and letting into your conscious mind, your subconscious programming, all this is mm -hmm. psychological. So why would you, what would you categorize this as Would if someone was to look at this way of seeing the human, dealing with the human? I mean... Or is it just an individual's cool. so, so, so experience and approach? When when you when when you give this when you give, and we're going to get into another rabbit hole. But when you give a human being the power to define his own reality, there's already a limitation. Do you know what I mean? I absolutely know what you mean. So if I'm in control of defining who I am, 
there is a limit to what I can achieve. You create separation. Not separation, no, it's just the knowing of all. The knowing of reality. So hmm. I'm I'm a created being. You know, yes, there's an intelligence. You get the most intelligent person that exi- that's ever existed. You know, bring them all together. Bring all the most intelligent people with all the Nobel Prizes in the world right now. Nikola Tesla. Right, yeah, Tesla, right? <laughs> bring bring Einstein, Tesla, all these people and sit them in a room. Because they are created, they live within a, this closed system, which is creation, the universe, cosmos, um, multiverse, whatever. We're bound by certain things. There's an there's there's a level of unknowingness to our reality. So there's always going to be a limitation to how we understand reality because we're trying to define things. And we live in a world where we have outsourced the definition of reality to certain institutions that are constantly evolving and changing the definitions of things, the definition of what a man is, the definition of what a woman is, the definition of what it means to be happy, the definition of what it means to be healthy. These, these are constantly changing. So if you're trusting human beings with, 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 with that, then there's going to be a never-ending... Mm, their own definition. Yeah. They could be the most intelligent, the most wise. So it, I came to a realization, or because of my, my belief in, in, in a creator and scripture um, and revelation, it makes things very easy for me to recognize my, my capacity to know my limitations, uh, my strengths and my weaknesses, when to seek guidance from outside of myself and when to seek inspiration from within myself. And the two aren't disconnected. So biopsychosocial spiritual makes sense to me as, as, a, as, as a practitioner or a physician or somebody who's interested in health or life preserving life and celebrating life because that's that's really what health is about it's about living in constant celebration and gratitude and being well disconnected from fear because that's where the cortisol lives you understand so we we want to be where the dopamine and the serotonin and the oxytocin hmm. and the endorphins are fear, but, fear is useful that we need it yeah, yeah of course now and then but i'm talking about a constant state of like a baseline function of fear. Like there has to be a balance. Fear is going to be a certain level of fear, but then fear of what? Mm-hmm. Fear of who? Do you know what I mean? So again, we have to define what deserves our fear, what deserves our respect. Back to definitions again. Exactly. Hey, so my question maybe to, to just ground us would be, we live, we need to categorize things to make sense of the world. We do this as... It's just it's as our very nature to to make sense, to make things easier, to yeah. make to bring it into our subconscious because that's important, so we can go about our day and do the things we need to do. So we need to categorize definitions. I agree, are ever evolving and changing, and they mm. are interpretive. And one definition yeah. for someone is is completely different from another. But but that's, it doesn't have to be. There has to be for me. What okay. I'm trying to get at is there has to be a baseline interpretation of reality for all. Sure. Because then we have a level playing field. So how do we? How do we figure well, that? So how we figure that, it's the point I'm trying to make is, I'm not here to tell you how you figure it. I'm just trying, I'm, I'm here to ask you the question, to rationalize with yourself, to go, is that actually possible in on the human plane or do we need something greater than ourselves to help us define these things? Because if it's, we're merely limited to us as humans categorizing reality, then there's going to be a lot of discrepancies and differences mm-hmm. in, in interpretation because mm-hmm. um, you know language isn't that okay I would say that um, flexibility and how you understand things is uh, okay within the framework of understanding what being aligned with a baseline truth mm-hmm. and a baseline understanding of what's real and what's not real because if we're living in a society where we, we have to raise, you know, children and your understanding of what a man and a woman is is different to my understanding of what a man and a woman is, right? 
then this is going to be a problem. Are we always going to have differences in? I, I get where, you, where you're going with this. And yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. love to understand yeah. your baseline understanding of reality. Or maybe we should just understand that. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, like, it's... You know... Because is this from your... I mean, do you connect with the word religious? Is it... Yeah, no. Does it come from your religious... No, I don't like the word religion. It's just more more, more of a, an understanding of reality or, or systems. Mm-hmm. And is that or, yeah very interesting? Inter- what's it called? Uh, yeah, introspective. No, there's, and th- this is where the the two don't have to be separate. So you, it's it comes it may come across to the listener that I have some level of rigidity to my understanding of definition, and what you're presenting is is more so of why can't there be you know flexibility and openness and i'm saying that the the two can coexist mm-hmm. do you understand it's not like it's not black and white but certain things have to be black and white to facilitate for the gray areas to be safe to play around you see i'm you see yeah, what i'm yeah, trying to say so i'm saying if human beings are left to their own desires to, and their own capacity to define reality what you have is the civilization we live in today chaos poverty Mm -hmm. um you know certain percentage of people that um have i would argue that because there have been people trying to agree on one thing and Mm -hmm. saying this is the way Mm -hmm. we've got ourselves into a whole heap of mess yeah but again the, these people aren't the people that are whoever they are we have to question what fuels their motive for sure because if there is the, a divine fuel to the Fear motive mainly. if there's a divine fuel to the motive then that should bring sure world world peace and or, or you know it, it should feed the hungry because clearly there's enough wealth to go around the world there's enough resources yeah, to go around it the world two years ago yeah why In, what, overnight why 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 are these children hungry and homeless and starving? Do you understand? So well, I think some people believe that it has to be that way. You yeah, know? okay. Most definitely this life we should go back to the pain thing. And this is why a lot of people that don't believe in a creator or to believe in a higher power go, oh, yeah, there's so much pain and suffering in the world. It has to exist. The the dual nature ha- has to always be there. What I'm saying is, from you've got so many different people fighting over control of definitions of things, mm-hmm. and that's that's the problem. So, so humans are left to their own uh, kind of uh, power structures mm-hmm. and their egos and their narcissism and psychopathy. You got a lot of psychopaths trying to fight for who's right and who has the right to define reality, because whether you want to accept it or not, if I want to put my child in school and then someone is telling me my child has to believe that this is true because I'm wait, this is part of the curriculum, mm-hmm. then you can't tell me it's a free world and people can do whatever they want because there's certainly a propaganda and an agenda to indoctrinate people into a certain way of. Yeah, Li- living and thinking. Mm-hmm. Now that, if you're in England and if you're in France or if you're in Germany or if you're in South America or if you're in the Middle East, th- th- there's it's going to be differences in curriculum. But what I'm saying is, is we're slowly moving into a into a, a globalized structure, and the last ten twenty years have, has been a proof of how everything is is becoming standardized across the world. Yeah. We're becoming one big community connected by an, by artificial intelligence and, and, and the web of virtualism. So what I'm saying is we have to... Humans are trying to control and define reality mm. and truth. And I don't see, you know, unless humans start taking control of their own selves and their own, you know, selves, family, structures, communities and tribes there being a change on, 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 on a more kind of societal level because it's clear to see where society is going with with its um, indoctrination of what is true and what is right 
because it comes it comes into the world politically and geopolitically and all of that. And I'm not a politician, but I'm just saying things are going a certain way. Mm -hmm. And and for those that don't want to kind of adhere to that, the only way out is to pull out of whatever is is not being normalized. Mm -hmm. So what would be the baseline level of reality that started this conversation? Like that you were saying everyone has to agree on something which is black and white. Yeah. So there's yeah, I guess respect in the grey areas and other no, things. Yeah, the we have to agree on the sanctity of life. Okay. For example. So if you were to define this reality. Yeah. What would what would you or some of the things that would fit into that, what would it be? Um Death is round the corner. That's reality. Mm -hmm. um, but that like could, I said, couldn't we disagree like, like, on what death means? Yeah, 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 yeah. I could not. I could, you know, I could hurt myself because I think death's going to be a peaceful existence. Yeah, but uh, and that could hurt people that don't agree with that. You know, you you let's use death as an example. Mm. Like you can think whatever. You'll find out. I'll find out. What I'm saying is it's an end to something and it's and and at the same time it is a beginning to something else. So it doesn't matter what your belief is about death and what my belief is about death. We're going to die. Now, what happens after is irrelevant here. The reality is death is it will happen. Do you know what I mean? We can agree and disagree of what that means and how to define it. We can define that physiologically. Your heart stops beating, your brain dies, there is no, you become a corpse, you know. But then if we go to the medical world and how they define death, someone's been in a coma for so long, you understand? And and now somebody can choose to stop a life force coming into that human being that's been assisted by a certain level of technology and then they become, they get declared as dead. But then there's brain dead, there's, do you know what I mean? So we're failing to agree on what death is. I'm just talking about mm -hmm. someone has hit the grave or someone's been, you know, burnt, you know. And, and so, like, where th there is no trace of life anymore. Mm -hmm. That's real. Do you know what I mean? So this comes into the definition of yeah reality. Yeah, re yeah, yeah, yeah. So the biggest definition of reality for me is death. You can, we can all agree on, and well, what what does that mean in a wider sense? Like, why is that important to define and agree on? When you realize your mortality, and you recognize your mortality, you'll take life serious. Mm -hmm. That's why death is important. That's why understanding what death actually is, it means you cease to exist. Your contribution on this realm ceases to exist now i'm not discussing what happens after i'm just talking about your ability to contribute to the now to what you have now your job your family your destiny mm. so so many people can can live life what unites all of us is death <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah okay. i feel like lots of religions in the past have used death as a way of controlling people also right? yeah yeah i'm I, I'm I'm not about I don't like control. I'm I'm not about control. I'm certainly not about control. I'm about honoring mm -hmm. and, and respecting life mm -hmm. and giving thanks to whatever whatever gave me life. And death is a huge part of that because that is the most guaranteed thing about my life. Yeah, it's a very important thing to like understand about but the I'm, relationship to it. Yeah, but you know, that that's a really interesting one when it comes to understanding someone like I remember something comes to mind now. I had I had a client who we didn't I didn't end up working too long with. It was three or four interactions. Um considering I worked with people for a long time. And one of their fears, and this is a successful entrepreneur, a successful coach, someone who was physically in shape, lean, had his shit together. Beautiful home, nice dog. Do you know what I mean? Scared shit about death. To the point where the fear of death was controlling how he was living. Now, that's an unhealthy relationship with death. Because 
being aware and conscious of death makes me honor every single moment of my life. It doesn't make me fear death. The whole focus on death is so that I can focus m on life mm -hmm. more. Memento mori. Presence, contribution, mm -hmm. growth, yeah. living the truth, mm -hmm. moving, flowing, creating, drawing. Like, that's why I remember death. Mm. But do you, do you feel that people won't take life seriously if they feel they're going to just come back as something else? You know, like what? Why is it important if only for you to for everyone to agree that death will come for you? And because I feel like it's it's a powerful topic, of course. Yeah, yeah. And what you're living for is extricably linked, if that's a word. To yeah. To what you die for. Yeah. So I feel like I love spending time talking about death and our relationship yeah. to it because it's fucking powerful. I just feel that some people can disagree on whatever happens after. It does definitely alter their relationship to now, to life. Yeah. Some people might not care, might might think that nothing happens. And I've had these conversations with people. There's just nothing. There's yeah. nothingness. And you don't Good exist. luck to those you people. You don't even remember. It's just like nothing have ever happened. And... It does affect their, their their relationship to life, but is it okay for them to have that perspective? Of course, everyone's. Yeah, like, I'm not here to force anyone to do or think anyway. I'm just uh, presenting something, and people have the choice. Sure. To th I'm, what I say, I'm just sharing my shit. Like, I'm not here to force you to believe and or agree or accept anything. Mm -hmm. What I would love for you to do is be open enough and objective enough to explore. Because that's, that's living. That's what we're about. We're about living. Living means you have to be open, tasting everything. If I put this beautiful f food offering for you right now, and you're like, mm, I'm not sure about that. I'm not going to eat that. Oh, that looks weird. Like, That's an indication of the traumas you're carrying in your in your mind and the limitations that you have and the fears that you have. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm working with people that have got you know, a really weird kind of relationship with food. Yeah. They won't touch this, they won't touch this, they won't touch it. And that's just the project. That's an, an indication of where they are neurologically because of the the parenting that they had and the closed the closed mindedness of food education as as they came into this world. So a lot of people that are afraid or don't want to talk about death, there is a direct reason why they say there's nothing there. Mm. I'm actually convinced. You know, and, and we'll fight like passionately to prove I'm not here to passionately prove anything I'm just flowing you can take what I say take it leave it sit on it r reflect on it meditate on it explore it further you have a choice you're a sovereign being but what I'm saying is I'm I'm just talking and I'm g giving you know inviting you to understand that the death thing you could really define a lot about a human being where they are with themselves where they are with life when you bring the topic of death up because like I said I had a client who was super successful in so many different ways you bring death up and you just you you get to see a different person there mm. which means there's an insecurity about death there's a fear and then you can go through that I understand why now you're trying to control your life like this you know what I mean and the way you're, you're, you're living is almost a like an, a, a delusion that you're not going to die. It's, it's never going to happen. I'm going to control all these things. Or I'm going to buy hack myself into immortality. I'm going to live forever. But the reality is when you have a healthy relationship with death and you explore what that means, it will have, it could create a healthy reflection on your life because you could be flexible and fluid about how you live. You could be more patient, more open, more resilient, I mean, more grateful. So the, the death is, is supposed to inspire you to value our realities in life and, and to to take life seriously to the point where if somebody offers you a plate of food, you will explore it. And if you don't like it, you leave it. But at least you explore it. You don't create a barrier and say, no, I'm not going to eat that because I think or I believe that this is going to create something in my body. Or, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's just about exploring. It's... it's and I, I suppose what I've been doing for so many years, I explored and dabbled in so much and I continue to do that. 
like the bumblebee that goes in, you know, and collects the pollen from the flower, and then, or the honeybee, or the bee. Not a lot of them around anymore. <laughs> Need but more of them. The bee that just will go to a, to a flower and, and take its nectar and create medicine out of it. Yeah. But there is a certain standard that the honeybee will not touch. So we need to have standards as human beings. We can't just be super open, super flexible, super, super, ev like no boundaries. Can't all be a free for all. There are laws of nature at the end of the day. Do you understand? And just like the bee will, will, will fly in a certain environment, it will eat a certain type of plant. And if it eats a certain type of plant and it gets, you know, tricked into eating a certain type of plant, it might have consequences for its life or its colony. So there are laws in nature. The sun comes at, up a certain time. Mm. The moon come, come, comes out. The rivers flow a certain direction. There are laws of physics, there are laws of chemistry, laws of, laws of biology. So certainly the human beings, through understanding what they can observe in the scene realm at least, there's a purpose for everything. And there's a purpose for death. Do you know what I mean? Especially if you're conscious of it before the moment comes where you have to face it. Do you know what I mean? So the sooner you can make it your business to think about and process that and allow it to inspire your life and your life becomes important and worth living, then your thought process of maybe taking your own life could be salvaged by just thinking about death. I mean, so many people committing suicide. So many people are in a state of anxiety and depression and a state of melancholy to the point where they feel like their life is not worth living anymore. Do you understand? But maybe... If they were introduced to the concept of death and the understanding it from a psycho kind of somatic level, it's not just a theoretical thing. You have to feel it. Like we're disconnected from funerals. We're disconnected from seeing people dying. We're disconnected from seeing people hit, go into the back into the earth. We're disconnected from seeing, you know, someone who was full of life today, and now they're just nothing. We don't do. We don't have that anymore. People are too busy. But you know, in our tradition, in our culture, there's always a constant connection with, with people that are dead or dying, or you know, we wash the bodies after, after someone's passed. There's a there's a washing purification process. There's a the burial process. There's an innate respect for for death because that's part of life. But it's over for that person. You got to pray and wish that they had you know they had a meaningful, impactful life. The purpose of you going to that funeral is to get inspired to go, man, oh, I'm going to change. I'm going to keep doing the same shit. Am I going to value my health or am I going to just, am I going to try and make a change? Am I going to add value to this human experience? Because we're all a collective. We, all, we are all the same body. Every single human being is connected. We all one unit. We come from the same thing. And every everyone is like a cell. Every human being that's alive right now is cell to the universal consciousness not just a physical cell but also a metaphysical cell so what you do will affect the greater collective as as humans you understand as a species but when you got so many people that are given up on themselves so easily it's it's disrespectful to the potential we have as beings so that's why I do what I do to try and inspire people to to do something with their life to value themselves long enough to not give up on themselves to try harder because ultimately that has an, an indirect effect on me as part of this collective and talking about death is a really big motivator to a lot of people yeah yeah absolutely so i've carried this coin in my my bum bag every most you know, every day it's with me yeah it's memento mori Memento Mori. So it's, it's in, it comes from a stoic time mm. where it was a phrase, you remember that you are mortal. Mm. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful story, but also um, it's a beautiful story and I'll share it. Ryan Holiday talks about it a lot. Who? You know, Ryan Holiday. Obstacle is the way and ego is the enemy. He's sure, an author, okay. uh -huh. but he, he really has delved into the work of the Stoics, Marcus Aurelius and meditations and all that. Cool. Wealth knowledge. But yeah, directly linked to death. So what would happen is when a, uh, a 
a Roman emperor would come back from a, a war mm. and they were riding around in the chariot the next day, the week after, mm. and they were like put on this pedestal. They were just glorified and like, yeah. you know, women, people just throwing themselves in there at their mercy, just like you are the greatest. They would feel godlike. I mean, you would. You've come back from a war. You've yeah, survived they're idolized. it. They're idolized. Absolutely. Yeah. So what the rulers of the empire would do is they would pay someone to, like a merchant, I think, would go and whisper in their ear just at the moment of like glorification and they'd mm. say memento mori. Mm. Remember that you are mortal and you'll die one day. Mm. You're not God. Mm. And it was this beautiful message yeah, you know, just to remember and bring you that back down to earth, just like we would do when we were out hunting with our friends. Mm. Don't get so big for your boots. It's like for sure we're all in this. <laughs> Humility is is central to to health, by the way, because humility puts your nervous system into a certain state. Um, so does gratitude. Gratitude and humility are both free. If you understand their vibration on a physiological plane, you know. So, I've been taught to adopt certain postures day daily, to remind myself of my dependence on something greater than me, and to teach me how to give thanks for the things that I have. So, these are archetypes to to health because if we go back to the medical model, or we go back to the alternative model. <laughs> It's very easy to sell a solution through a product or a material, a physical, elemental, structural product, a herb, a potion, you know, something that you can ingest. But if you can instill a belief system in someone, um, an understanding, mm. um, you know, that is far more powerful. Yeah, it permeates for everything, right? Exactly. Um, it can, and it can change states. So you can write somebody a poem. That could be a medicine. Music. Right? Yeah. Now, depending on what vibration, frequency of music. So I don't listen to a lot of music because it's, it's all about frequency. What you're channeling with that music. Do you understand? Because mm -hmm. th there, there is a whole alchemy with that. Um, so I'm very careful with what with the energies that I that that I that I welcome into my presence because I don't know what what they will carry into my presence. Yeah, I agree man. It does takes you somewhere. You understand. So um coming back to the and this is what I, I try ultimately try and empower my patients with is beyond the the diet and the nutrition of the physical self you have to consider the nutrition of the spiritual self and that is at the forefront of the transformations that people have when they work with me because I just bring them into an awareness that the, the spiritual food, the soul food is far more powerful and as you said permeates and penetrates deeper into your being than just the herb um, you know the fasting there are people you know we fast our tradition is a tradition of fasting. There's a lot of healing in fasting. Literature will tell you about all the physiological things that happen when you fast. But there's no data about what happens in on the spiritual plane when you fast. So if it wasn't for scripture and for revelation, we wouldn't really have an understanding or concept of fasting beyond the physical plane. Do you understand? So if you look, you know, when we fast in every year in, in accordance with the lunar cycle and, and the months and the flow of nature because everything has to be we can't be separate from nature so even the fasting even the healing even the cupping even the eating has to be connected with how the sun is moving and how the earth is moving do you know what I mean because we're not separate from this stuff we live in brick brick behind you know between brick walls um, and are being influenced by all this radiation but as much as that is trying to disconnect us from our 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 cosmic kind of um architecture, the humans are connected to what's happening in in the galaxies 
have to be. So if you're trying to tell me that I'm just merely someone who has to wake up every day and slave away and pay the bills, and, and I'll just eat just to survive, well, what, what fun is there in that? Because, cool, you, you might be working and, and you've got a nice house and you've got a nice car and you drive, you know, you've got some nice shoes and you've got a couple of nice watches. You, you're buying your missus diamond rings, but for what? Because I see a lot of these people, every single one of them is, is clinically depressed and sick. Haven't got their shit together. Constantly chasing more and more and more and more. So... If you go to the spiritual plane and, and, and feed the soul what it needs to be healthy, and that is the ultimate question. What is the ultimate spiritual diet? There are certainly archetypes which all these spiritual movements share. Mm. I've had a few of them on the podcast. <laughs> right, I see them. Everyone's on their journey, no judgment. Mm. I just focus on me, and I'm here so I'll talk about my stuff. But it's not my... Like I said before, I've tapped into... A universal poem you know I've, I've it's written in the stars and that poem has transformed me from a certain state to a certain state so my faith is not just blind I just believe I believe with my senses my rational my spiritual my physical because I've tasted that spiritual food and it brings me into calibrates me better than anything and it's free so anybody who's trying to heal themselves or working wants to heal wants to change wants to improve if there isn't a spiritual element to your your regime you're always going to hit a plateau because the soul needs to eat and it needs to eat daily because the soul is being bomb bombarded in the society that we live in the spiritual self is just being like sedated on such a level and, and and disguised does it bring you sadness what brings me sadness does it bring you sadness no because it's a, it's the reality i'm i'm i feel i feel sad for people that want to continue believing that you know having a nice career driving a nice car and wearing a nice watch is is, is success because again, it's like, what is health? What is success? Who defines that? you got a load of people saying, on the internet, defining success. But, you know, my definition of success, again, I've tapped into something greater than me that, that teaches me and shows me the archetype of success. And s success is certainly not on a physical plane. You know, and th the biggest thing you... The biggest asset you can hold in the physical material plane is your health. Mm -hmm. You know, your ability to change a situation with your own hands. That's success. Because if you're powerless, if you've got a nice car, big big house and a ton of money in your bank account and you can't protect your wife or your kid, you know what I mean? You can't bring them happiness. You can't make them feel whole and safe. Man, you're a fool. So... The answer lies in the spiritual stuff and, and and the metaphysical food, you know. And that's why people can go in caves and go up mountains and don't need to eat much. And I've I live it. I've lived it. I know what that is. Not surviving off what I ate yesterday, mm -hmm. you know. No food, no water in my system. Nil by mouth, and I'm I'm super sharp, um, su su super effective, super efficient, in tune. And I'm not eating anything. No berries, no adaptogens, no shilajit, no matcha, no raw milk, nothing. Obviously that is dependent on the food that I ate yesterday. But my body is, de is designed to live in starvation. But then, why would I call it starvation if my soul is eating? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm actually removing the obstacles of... The, the energy needed for my digestive tract to process all of these foods that I'm eating, even if they're super nutritious, mm -hmm. still takes energy. Yeah, I think it's really powerful to recognize when you're not filling it with physical things what the spiritual nourishment yeah. feels like. Yeah. That you can really feel when you're out there under the sun, 
when you're connecting with something bigger yeah, yeah. than yourself, whatever exactly. that may look like to you. And these are just archetypes. Yeah. These are archetypes with the crossovers. I feel, I feel we can't really leave it here because <laughs> now we've got into soul food and there's a whole you know. a whole category. Well, let's not say category. People just need to understand, you know, let, let's leave it. Let's, yeah, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Look, look. Um, cause I've got to edit this bad boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> with three camera angles. Now, look, you have people that are, you know, we're in a rabbit hole of the. I've been in 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 this on doing this work for many years, and some we forget that, that on the mass level, people are, have no idea. They don't know where to start. You know, they hit the gym, they got their protein shaker. It's really sad. You know what I mean state of affairs you know, Southgate you, you, gym. Could, you, you know what I mean I can't go to that gym anymore yeah. I gave it another I went twice it's yeah. just it's a it's a very um, mm. it's, it's I guess I get to I go through all different emotions and I arrive at sadness yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't you know, I have to feel that and then just I can't it. go to the, I can't go to a public gym but <laughs> you, most people's definition of how how do I get healthy? You know, and I'm I'm listening to conversations. I'm in the changing room. You know, last week I was in the I was in the gym. I got a guest pass from a friend. I wanted to hit, use a sauna, right? Um, so I was in a public gym. You know, um, you know, a good high end public gym, paying a lot of money, ninety pound a month. Do you know what I mean? And that is the epitome of health in in that community, right? You go there to get healthy. You go there to get fit, and it really isn't. No, it's far from very disconnecting so we have people who are watching now they're talking to the people that want to get healthy and want to be fit and want to change their life and want to cut the booze and want to cut the cigarettes they're not you know they're not happy with their job and they think that lifting weights and running on a treadmill is the answer it's not you have to go to the soul you have to find your purpose and you have to embrace the pain um, and try and translate what the pain is trying to communicate with you be beneath all the ego and the fear and the narcissism and insecurities you have to just be real and honest with the things that are challenging you and go to the spirit go to the emotions otherwise if you don't do that then everything that you fuel yourself with physically is just a symptom managing loophole that will just leave you disempowered because you know you hit your PB and you're deadlifting 20 kilos more than you were last last month or last year does not change the fact that your wife don't like you or you keep going from relationship to relationship do you know what I mean getting a six pack is not going to cure your it's not going to fix the fact that you can't hold a relationship so men need to be a little bit more real with themselves and take ownership of themselves and their masculinity. We didn't go there today, which is great, and we won't go there. And and women need to take care of their femininity and understand it's deeper than just how you project yourself outwardly to the world. And if you go to the the deeper shit, which you don't talk about with people day in day out, you may actually find answers to why you're still suffering and why you're still pretending, and ultimately why you're still sick. You know. Beautiful man. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, man, bless. It's a good, it's a good, um, yeah, overview of the, the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, man. It's deep. I love that because you care. And yeah, for sure. What you said earlier about you don't want people to like you, you want people to change for them. Yeah, That's yeah. That's powerful, man. It's funny because I never actually thought we'd start this podcast. <laughs> you just, you know, like, when we obviously I realised 10 minutes definitely in. start no 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 no, no. <laughs> because we're finishing now no but I didn't want to say that 10 minutes in but 10 minutes in I was like right if we actually started because which, which is very subtle actually I really like that yeah man I just I cut it in whenever yeah there was no um, okay <laughs> which, is, which is dope which is dope because I just went straight into you know what I mean there was no kind of prepare myself because the introduction hey it's more of a bam super subtle and then I found myself sharing so yeah you know I, I i appreciate how you just subtly just initiated the conversation um it's great and thanks for having me on man yeah it's been a long time coming <laughs> yes man let's have a hug anyway yeah come appreciate on. it man